Hi everybody, I'm DJ Sixsmith. Welcome to Sit Down. Very special guest in the building. NBA champ, Meta World Peace. Thanks for having me. What's up, man? How are you? Everything is great, man. How is it being at CBS? How long have you been here? I've been here for almost four years. Oh, really? Good spot. Get That's to talk great. to people like you about your projects. Where were you before? Uh, I graduated from college. First oh, really? College. Oh, yeah. beautiful. So yeah. I went to Fordham. You played some of your high school games yes. at the Rose Hill Gym. Yes. That's where I won my city title at. Yeah, yeah. At Fordham University. It was hopping. Yeah, man, I, I, it was an amazing experience. You probably had more people in the stands for your games than any Fordham games. Wow. Fordham, <laughs> and, well, who, well, who was coaching there? Was Fran Fischilla coaching at Fordham? He was at Manhattan. He went to Manhattan. Right. Also. Uh, and then he came, he was at St. John's. He, he never was at Fordham? Never was at Fordham. Which coach was at Fordham? It was like a really good coach. Couple well, let's see. Derek Wittenberg was a coach at Fordham. Brian Hill was a coach okay, at Fordham. Okay, maybe. So maybe yeah. one of those guys. But yeah, yeah. could have used a guy like you from the city to play at Fordham. I know, I know. Just never actually happened. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I watched the documentary, Quiet Storm, the Ron Artest story. So first of all, congratulations on that. Thank you. And I thought it was cool because you just laid it all out there. Yeah. Your whole entire life. So what was it like putting this thing together, and why was now the right time for you? I mean, it was great because the, the documentary kind of summed up on a big platform in my career. And my career, my, my career, it was up and down. So a lot of those um, relationships that a professional athlete like myself, at the skill level and the talent level I had, a lot of the relationships they make with, with uh, brands or media, I didn't really have that. So you, you see when guys are retiring, you know, they, they got the media send off and all this stuff. Because of my career, I didn't really have that. So to put out a documentary on Bleacher Report, which didn't start out as a big, you know, corporation, but when it was acquired, and now CBS, is, you know, with Showtime, mm -hmm. is involved. I mean, this is a huge opportunity for me to sum up um, not so much the basketball part, but just the overall career. You know, um, a little bit of basketball. I was a good player, but the personal side. The emotional side, spiritual side is all in there. Yeah. You know, so I'm really happy to be able to do that on this platform so my next documentary I can get into basketball. Mm. You know, only basketball and show people, you know, how I was on the court. You know, so I'm really grateful, you know, for this documentary. Well, I like where your head's at. You're already thinking about the next documentary. Yeah, I, I, I am because if you look at the typical documentary, look at Come Fly With Me with Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. LeBron's gonna have an amazing one. Oh yeah, um, you know Kobe's had the the muse, mm -hmm. and you know in his own words, his own artistic expression of his career. Mine is defense. Yeah. In an era where Jordan was leaving, and the great Hall of Famers, the future Hall of Famers, was present: Paul Pierce, Vince Carter, um, Dirk, K Dirk. Yep. Kobe. Kobe. Yeah. You know, and I was in the mix and the best defensive player in that era. Mm. So I'm really happy for this documentary because now I'm able to get to the basketball part. This documentary is super, super important. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I think in order to understand you, you have to go back to Queensbridge and yeah. understand what was going down there. Mm -hmm. So when you guys were showing that part of the film, what was most important in terms of showing your family and also the area you grew up in? Well, in terms of the production of the film, the writing, the directing, I was just the talent and the, the center of mm -hmm. attention. Yep. <laughs> but so I, I didn't really understand, you know, all the ins and outs of how they was going to produce it. Quite frankly, I, didn't, I was going to produce my own documentary eventually. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. Right. You know? So I didn't, I didn't really know, like, what type of shots they're trying to catch, what type of feel they're trying to give off. I just pretty much showed up for an interview a couple times, told my story, um, had my, my autobiography came out also, so I talked about that a little bit, and Johnny Sweet, Omar, those are the guys I worked with. They took it to the next level. Yeah. You know, they took it to the next level. Uh, when I was talking to Omar, we clashed a lot about the documentary. What'd you guys clash about? I mean, we clashed about, um, First, I was trying to figure out what, why do you want to do a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a you fascinating know? story. You got to realize that. <laughs> I, I, I know, but I'm just like, for what, you know? And right. I wanted to tell a story a certain way, so mm -hmm. I, got, I was really passionate and frustrated at times because I'm like, if I'm going to give somebody my documentary, 
I needed to be told the right way. So I didn't know it was going to go to Showtime. These guys had a big, uh, bigger picture with bigger everything. picture. Yeah. So I'm very grateful. Um, we was even clashing about the music because mm. I'm like, if I do a documentary, you know, Tragedy Gaddafi is my favorite rapper mm -hmm. from Queensbridge. Now Nas is the king of Queensbridge. Yeah, I was gonna say right? that's the guy usually people mention. He was the guy I looked up to. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to be like Nas, and I wanted to be like Mob Deep when I was mm -hmm. growing up, but on the basketball court. Right. Tragedy Gaddafi was my favorite rapper and one of the most well-respected rappers from Queensbridge. I wanted, you know, his music in my documentary, <laughs> <laughs> but we need to go mainstream, and they're thinking bigger. You know, it was certain people music that I'm not gonna say I didn't want in my documentary, but it's certain music that I'm like emotionally attached to. Right, it represents you, you it's know, true to you. Yeah, I get that. Quiet Storm, <laughs> yep. Mob Deep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it don't get no better than that. No, that was the perfect title and perfect fitting for and, that. And Tragedy Gaddafi gave Mob Deep their name. Mm. So it's so much that's leading back to Tragedy. Mm. Now, Tragedy is a very controversial rapper, conscious rapper from our neighborhood, but he birthed a lot of the artists there. So this, this the, the music is super important to me. Quiet Storm, Queensbridge, Prodigy, Rest in Peace Prodigy, Mob Deep. Um, back in the days, I remember, you know, when they talk about Killer B, you know, on, on those old Mob Deep albums. You know, my family and Killer B, you know, they lived on the same floor mm. and, and with Havoc, you know, and getting into all the same things, you know, in the streets. So I remember being a little kid and seeing Havoc open the door and close it. Wow. You know, key on, <laughs> you know, and, and making music and sometimes going outside and, and seeing Killer B outside more than Havoc. I didn't have a great relationship with Havoc. Mm -hmm. I, I, I seen um, uh, Killer B more than Havoc. Okay. So Quiet Storm is like, I mean, I could go on and on and on really about, about this documentary, but I'm very satisfied you should and be. grateful. You really Absolutely. should be. So another part of the whole Queensbridge story is the no layups mentality. Yeah. And that follows you through throughout your career. So when did that start for you in terms of you're not letting guys get to the rack without being punished? Well, the, the Queensbridge, my di first, it started with my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad takes me to, to the court, big, strong man, and he would never let me get layups. When I would go to the hole, he would push me, and I just kept fighting, kept fighting. It, it, it kind of reminds me of my son, um, all my kids are different, mm -hmm. but I remember when my son Jerron was playing basketball in my house in the end, he fell on the floor. He was playing against grown men, he was crying. So I'm like, as a dad, I'm like, hey, you know, just, just get off the floor, you're gonna be okay. Yeah. He's crying, limping, bleeding, and, and kept playing, limping. I'm like, wow, this kid is pretty tough. That moment reminded me of a moment with my dad. You know, um, and even my son now, my, my, my other son, mm -hmm. Ron, they just, so relentless you know, with their career just continuing to push forward. And that's what No Layups is, you know, it's about, uh, you know, you gotta work for everything. And Qu Queensbridge, you know, it, it molded me 12th Street, the 41st side of 12th Street was the block that I grew up playing basketball on. And then the other blocks, like the 40th side of Vernon, um, the, the Reese Center, the 40th side of 10th Street and the Reese, those are places where I played the most. And, um, so, and I, I never really played um, outside courts on 10th Street, but every one of those parks, people were going hard. A lot, yeah. a lot of defense, a lot yeah. of defense. And then you finally beat your dad at age 15. Yeah, man. Long time coming, I'm sure. I, well, actually, I beat my dad earlier. Okay. But at the age of 15, my dad wasn't able to beat me no more. It was a wrap. That was it. It was over. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 15. And yeah. I, I remember, like, wow. And my dad wanted to, I remember my dad saying, hey, you want to play some ball? I'm like, dad, I don't want to play today. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, dad, come on. It's not fair anymore. Yeah, it wasn't fair anymore. And I didn't know how to go soft against my dad. No, you only knew one way. One way. Yeah. We, we, since we were 10, we started competing against each other, full court and all that stuff. It was always just like, I'm trying to win. Yeah. You know, so I got tired of really hitting my dad, <laughs> you know, and... It was too competitive. The games are too competitive. And that coincides with you really becoming a big time ball player in the city. So yeah. take me back to the days you, Elton Brand, your boy Lamar Odom. When are you guys starting to cook and when do you start to realize that you guys could really do this going forward? The first time I played against Lamar Odom 
was at DS Park in Ravenswood, um, 21st Street. He was 11 years old. We, we was 11. Mm-hmm. And I, was, I think I was six foot. And Lamar was like either one inch shorter or taller than me. I can't remember. There were some big 11-year-olds right there. Big 11-year-olds. <laughs> and I remember the next year coming back, Lamar was 6'6". Six, six, mm. You know, and we were still competing against each other. I remember looking up to Lamar like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> he's super tall. And you're like, dude, you're a lefty also? Yeah, and a lefty and super smooth. Oh, man. And we started to play with each other at the age of 13. Mm. And then Elton came like maybe a week or a month after me and Lamar went to Riverside Church yeah. with, uh, with the great Ernest Lutch uh, at Riverside Church. And we just continued to play and play. I just don't remember us losing. I, maybe at one, we lost one time, one summer we went 67-1. and one. Wow. We lost against Barry and Davis team, but that was one summer, our last summer together. And, and the summers before that, I just don't remember losing. Hmm. Yeah, I can't remember. You guys losing. were rolling. We were, we were winning championships by 50. And the thing about us, if we up 20, we want to go up 40. <laughs> yeah, we you want to go punish up people. 50. Yeah. And we were going to championship games like, yo, let's win by 30 tonight. Hmm. Let's win by 50 tonight, you know? It wasn't a lot of close games. So let's go to your time at St. John's because you had some great memories there, obviously the Elite Eight run. What do you remember the most about your time with the Johnnies? Oh, uh, St. John's, it, it was a good time. It was about New York, you know, uh, I'm from New York, and I went to St. John's. It was between Miami and St. John's. And I said, okay, I'm just going to stay home in New York. The plan was St. John's and the Knicks, you know, um, because I, 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 I'm New York bred. <laughs> New York through and through, yeah. Everything. So the Nick thing happened late. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to happen earlier. But, you know, St. John's is a good experience. It's the capital college for New York. Yeah. Totally. Playing at the Garden. Playing at the Garden. I mean, I, I would have been happy at LIU. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe Manhattan College. Okay. Um, you know, Fordham, I would have been like, okay, with, but. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah. you know, when you are a high school player, yeah. you're not going to go to Fordham University. No, definitely not. No. But, but St. John's makes sense. I but get Fordham that. Fordham is history yeah, because absolutely. you play the high school championships at right, Fordham. Right, you're playing at the Rose Hill Gym. It's a big deal for high school. But I college is not the same thing. I wouldn't have been mad if I went to Fordham. I got you. Because it's, it's, it's about New York City. That's what it's about right. at the end of the day. You're Queens College. Yep. You know, and it's just something about winning in New York. Yeah, it's different. And, 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 representing, and representing New York. Definitely. You know, and I, and I did it as a player, and I'm hoping one day I can do it as a coach. Um, the NCAA platform, the NBA platform is great. But if, that, if those platforms don't work out for me, you know, thanks to social media and so many other ways to market, you know, I'm hoping to come back to New York and coach at a high level um, on a platform that provides me, the, you know, the, you know, the outlet. Yeah, and I, I, can, I can see you doing upset. that one day. Absolutely. Yeah, because from, uh, you've done it with player development. You've Absolutely. done it with defense, offense. You've been around the grades you're the type of player that would be a great coach Definitely. as opposed to a big-time player who may not be able to understand all the different types of role players and everything. Well, it's cool because I had my time in Indiana where I was, you know, second to Jermaine. Yeah. I had my times in other teams where I was the number one option. And, and then I had my times where I had to fit in as a teammate. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to say I'm going to be a great coach. But the only reason I would say I'm going to be a great coach is because I love coaching. You're a passionate guy. Right? Yeah. So... Yeah, I'm going to be the best coach. It's not saying I'm better than another coach. It's just saying I personally love coaching, hmm. you know, and I do it differently. You know, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more wiser now and, you know, older. Yeah, but at you, the same you, time. You've evolved as a person. Right? I evolved as yeah. a person, but I still have a different style of coaching. Right. You know, it's not going to be, you know, I really dread coaching in a suit, you know, <laughs> Sometimes I might want to have my hoodie on, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it doesn't make me, you know, any less any of a coach. Any less of a coach, yeah. It's just, my, you know, you live, you live once and you got a dream, you know? Mm. And I dream one day of coaching at a high level and just like, you know? Yeah, go for it. Bringing that street to it. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's who you are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, let's run through some NBA stories because yeah. you go to Chicago. Dude, you worked at Circuit City yeah. with the Bulls. How did that happen? You know, um, I was 19 years old, and I was um, I was running the streets of Chicago. You know, I was, and if you know Chicago, if America knows Chicago, mm-hmm. 
I should not have been certain places in mm -hmm. Chicago. Now, I'm not saying I was in danger because if, if you're from a, a, a community and you go to a hood and they, they respect where you're from, so I didn't go there as like a gangster. I wasn't in these neighborhoods, but I was, I was in places I shouldn't have been and, you know, partying a little too much. Mm -hmm. And I saw my performance wasn't happening. So Circuit City was a place where my friends were working at the time. And I said, you know what? After practice, I got so much time. And I'm driving to Chicago. And I'm just, you know, doing all sorts of things I shouldn't be doing. Might as well be productive in my time. Yeah, I needed to be productive. I was trying to do anything to stay occupied. I was 19 years old. I had two, two, two kids mm -hmm. at, at the time already. And so, I, you know, a parent, professional player, getting in trouble. It was just too much. Yeah. And I was trying to be as positive as I can at it as a 20-year-old, 19-year-old kid. No, I totally understand. Once the Bulls found out, they're like, you know what, can you come back to the facility? But I get where you're at at that point yeah. in your life, you know? Yeah, definitely. You know, um, it was just, yeah, I was at the point where I just wanted to be positive, productive, you know, all, all the time. No, I feel you. So when I think about your story, mental health is obviously a huge part of it. And, you know, it's hereditary in your family. Yeah. And thinking about some of the early stops in your career, because there were teams like the Pacers, like the Bulls, tried to get you the proper help that you Absolutely. needed at the time. So when you reflect on that now, what did you need at that time and what was working at that time for you? So as I reflect on my uh, emotional unbalance mm -hmm. at that time, I think it was more, um, a, a lot of it has to do with the family. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm 19 at that time, but my parents separated at 13. Right, that, that's a huge thing. It's a huge thing, it's yeah. a huge thing. It's not as easy for people to deal with. And then I had my first baby at 17. So three years before that, my parents just separated. I'm entering into a relationship where I don't really understand how to be in a relationship, mm -hmm. yet alone 16 years old. I wouldn't even advise my 16-year-old child to have a baby and be in a relationship. Right. I was with uh, my wife at the time. We was together for like 17 years. I made a lot of mistakes in between that. I wasn't mature, you know, and but who, what 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid is mature? Right. With what 21-year-old? With a life-changing moment like having a child and also going to the NBA and getting having millions a of child, dollars. Having a child and then going to the NBA. Right. You know, still young, seeing other women. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, a, it was a stressful time. Trying to do the right thing. Right. You know, it was very confusing at that time. And... You know, I wish um, I could have handled things differently, but, you know, what you going to do? And the conversations about mental health weren't in the same place. And, like, even in the documentary, it's mentioned, like, you weren't talking to your teammates about no. stuff. You were very closed off and in your own world. So yeah. what was the most difficult part of that situation? Why did you feel like you couldn't talk to your teammates about certain things? The reason I, I feel like I couldn't talk to my teammates is because if you have a problem and you go to one of your teammates or you go to uh, one of your front office people or coach, you're thinking, like, they're going to, think something's wrong with you, mm. they're not going to sign you to a contract. Right. You know? All these crazy things going through your head. Um, then you're thinking, if you tell someone about you, 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 you're vulnerable. Right? Yeah. And then is that whole trust factor, is that whole someone disappointing you? Someone you know, judging you. Um, judging. And one good example could be, you know, if you're a kid, you love your parents or you love your friends so much, or your girlfriend, whatever the case may be, and um, they let you down, you know? All those things was things that I was guarding. And new friends, I, was, I didn't really trust a lot of people, you know, so the whole new friend thing, having to sit in front of someone and talk um, and thinking I don't really trust you. Yeah. No, it's a difficult thing. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's crazy, man. And um, there's things I laugh about now. Um, like, you know, guys like Al Harrington, one of, one of, one of the best friends a person can mm -hmm. have. Yeah, one of your ride or die guys, yeah. Uh, yeah well, I, I haven't been through a lot with Al Harrington in terms of, like I've been with Steve Jackson and John right. O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, different story with those But guys. in terms of like, when he, before he left, he was a good friend. Reaching out, hey, come over to the house. Hey, let's get some lunch. Jermaine O'Neill, hey, let's get some lunch. Are you all right? And... You know, um, that's why I always tell people to make sure you keep your relationships. I always tell my players, got to coach players that I mentor, you know, make sure you keep all your relationships. And basketball is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you mentioned relationships, and one of the most interesting parts to me was the whole Jermaine O'Neal relationship. Yeah. I didn't realize the extent of things with you guys, yeah. the difficulty in that relationship. And yeah. I thought he was very honest in terms of feelings he had for you, Man. some disappointment, some hate. Man. So what was it like for you to, to hear that all? And you guys didn't speak for 14 years or hey, whatever. What was that like for you to watch that? See, look, this, this is the thing with Jermaine. Jermaine's from the hood, too. Mm -hmm. You know, Jermaine just handled things way more professionally than me. He was, he was ready for the NBA, I wasn't. Okay, Jermaine is a really good friend, right? So, to anyone. So if Jermaine is your friend and you kind of turn your back, yeah, I mm. would be upset too, you know? For me, you know, I never wanted friends and I really didn't care how somebody else felt, which is the wrong approach. I mean, if you don't want friends, you still can respect other people. I didn't have no respect. You weren't even thinking about that at the time. I don't know if I'd have no respect, but I was frustrated. Whatever the case may be, it was kind of disrespectful when, you're, when somebody supports you, then the next year you come back and you say, hey, you know, I want to uh, trade. Mm. <laughs> you know, like you want something better. Right. Or I want something better or I don't like the people I'm around. Like I don't like, you know, Jermaine or Donnie or, or Steven or Jamal Tinsley or Anthony Johnson. You know, or Scott Pollard, you know, like, I don't, you mean I don't like these people? Mm. You know, these questions I ask myself sometimes. Or I want something better, I want to go to another team. Why? Because, and as a young player, immaturity, you know, not responsible, um, ego. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, Egos are huge things e in a team like know, that. Ego could kill you. Yeah. Ego could kill you, man. And that's why I like the Warriors so much. Mm. I love how they play. Even, still, even though Stephen Curry is like the man, yeah. he still kicks the ball up. He's setting good screens. It's a beautiful he's, thing. He's practicing, you know, Kawhi Leonard, you know. He's playing the right way. He's hustling. It's not all about him, although he's very confident. You know, that's, that's why I, 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 I kind of reflect, you know, I kind of look at myself through other guys sometimes because mm -hmm. I kind of wish, like, wow, I wish my career was like that. And I always kind of look at these guys and be like, wow. That, that's how, that's a, that's a professional. What's the hardest thing for you to look at in terms of what ifs about your career? Well, the one, there's a lot of things that I, there's a lot of things that I, I don't like about my career. Name a um, couple. Well, I'm one time defense player of the year. Mm -hmm. One two time, time all-star. One time all-star, two time first team all defense. Mm -hmm. Two time second team all defense. One time uh, third team all NBA. Uh, champion. Yep. So those are eight awards. Now, the, the year before I got defensive player of the year, I, was, I led the league in flagrants and text. I probably should have got defensive player of the year that year. Mm. So let's just add one there. Sure. Ben Wallace got it. Okay, he was a great defender. He got four defensive player of the year titles. Um, we had a love for the big man back then. We did, we did. You know? Ben Wallace was great. I felt like I should have had maybe two of those. Mm -hmm. um, then, I get, then I get suspended. So the year I get suspended, I'm coming off of a defensive player of the year and all-star. Right. So add one more all-star. Add another first team all defense. And potentially another championship in that at, Maybe add a championship you know, there. It's possible that year. Add defensive player of the year again, yeah. maybe. So a couple, yeah, a couple defensive player of the years. Maybe add a title. Yeah. Those are a couple what ifs. And I, the other year I got third team all NBA. Mm -hmm. So maybe add a second team. Yeah. No, you're, you, were, you were on the rise with everything. Right. Pre Mouse of the Pals, you were on the rise with everything. And you realized that. So that's like eight, eight awards that I got over you know, a couple years. You know, maybe, maybe it's 20 awards. Mm. I'm not saying awards is everything, but you know, just play your career. Just, just, just go through. Just go about it the right way. You know, play basketball, have fun, go home, be the best you can be, and come home with 24 awards at the end of your career. 30 awards. I only got eight. Right, and it come, when it comes <laughs> to Hall of Fame and stuff like that, we look at those accolades. You look at those things. It's an important thing. Now, it's an argument, but if someone is in there saying, "I don't really like that guy. I don't want that guy to get in," or he don't deserve it, you can say this is why. You can, you can go to the stats. Right. You know, I, you know the, the, the one argument I have is defensive player of the year mm -hmm. at 23 years old. Yeah. One of the youngest. Big deal. Yeah. You know, um, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in the era where people were Hall of Famers in their prime, I was the best defensive player in, in, in the league at that time. Yeah. So I do have a small argument, but that's, that's something that, you know, I'm always thinking about, like those awards. Now, I don't look back, and I don't even have those awards anymore. I, I got a few of them, but not really. Some of them's chipped and stuff because 
when I look at it, it's just, it's just not complete. No, I got you. It's really not complete. Well, when I think about your career, I think for a long time you were defined by one night. Yeah. And you had to deal with that. But there were some interesting things that I learned from that night. Number one is uh, Ben Wallace throwing the wristbands at you. Number two <laughs> was you guys not both getting tossed in that moment. Oh, man. And then number three was, I didn't ever realize you went after the wrong guy. Oh, yeah, I yeah, had no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. That night was crazy, man. So, What do you still remember? What's, well, what's the big thing all these years later? Well, the one, th the ejection, when I, when I look back at it, and whether I justify it or blame, because mm -hmm. I do blame some people for that event. Sure, yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I can understand. The, the, guy hits you with a cup. You're saying, I want to go out after that guy, because, again, that's your mentality. No layups mentality on the court, off the court. I get that. You realize it was the wrong move to go into the stands, right, obviously, right, right. Later, but I, I get where you're coming from. Right, and, and you know, Jermaine O'Neal's actually producing a documentary on the brawl, mm. which is going to be really cool. And we talk, we talk about a lot of things, but, the, the, you know, the, the ejection. Yeah. You know, when someone hits you, it's, when I mean, they throw something at you, they push you, they throw a headband, they throw a wristband. That, that They're still trying to attack you. Automatic. I'm here for five minutes. I'm, I'm on the table for five minutes. You, it, it's, it's, it's what happened to that? What right. happened to the whistle, tech, and the um, hand that, gesture? That should have been automatic. That points towards the locker room. Yeah. It was like they, they were trying to figure out, wow, Ben Wallace just fell wrong, but, but, but Ron Artest is crazy. This, this cannot be Ben Wallace's fault. <laughs> mm. Right? So it was like, and then um, it was a lot of frustrating moments at that time where I felt I took the bulk of it, and I'm fine with that. I'm really fine with taking the bulk of the blame. I've been doing that for my life. Sure. I don't really care. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I thrive in chaos, but, you know, um, it was things that happened uh, that could have been differently. Um, like what? Well, you know, I think um, the suspension was harsh, but I guess they had to. I, I don't know what's happening at the front office behind closed doors. Right, because that basically that's the most, the worst moment of the decade. It was a bad moment. They feel like we need to make a statement. Got to make a statement. At that time, our test is the guy. We're going to suspend him the rest of the season. Yeah, and it happened, and yeah. I was already, and, and it was, and you could justify it because I was already getting in trouble anyway. Right. I led the league in text, mm -hmm. flagrants, all, all, you know, my whole career. Right. Right. So you, you could justify, it, but that's something that happened, and um, you know, the opportunity costs, a, a lot of things. You know, uh, teams not wanting me mm -hmm. at, you know, but it's not because of the brawl. Really, it was because of me. I'm not. There's certain things I don't want to put the blame on. Sure. So I'm not gonna put the blame on a team not wanting me because of the brawl. That was because like, I was I was very disruptive in the locker room. I was very disruptive on the court, detrimental mm -hmm. to the to the uh, balance, you know, and to the chemistry of a team. And I definitely was those things at that time. I got you. I wonder what the months were like for you after that because you were just kind of away from the team. It doesn't really get yeah. into it too much in the documentary. So what was life like and how did you deal with everything? Because you, like you said, you thrive in chaos and there's no real way to prepare for this type of moment because you'd always had basketball and then basketball you know, gone. Um, you know, pretty much just um, soul food. <laughs> soul food? I remember, I remember when that happened, you know, soul food was something that was, I was able to just like Some good okay. comfort food there? Definitely. Mm. You know, um, I love all types of food, and I remember having Italian food, and I remember, like, just my career is almost over at 23 years old, just struggling, and I remember going to, it was a, it was a soul food spot in Indiana, and I remember having some mac and cheese, collard greens, I'm like, and I was eating that for, like, a while, a long mm. time. <laughs> it was very comforting. Yeah, but yeah. There, there was the moment you weren't sure if you'd play ball again in the NBA. Well, you know, I was, I was suspended, uh, what, was it, what do they call it? Indefinite suspension? Yeah, yeah, indefinite. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know what indefinite mean right. you know, until I got suspended. I'm like, I looked up the word in the dictionary. I'm like, oh, mm. wow. It's open-ended. Right. <laughs> well, I think one of the most interesting parts of your story is the way that you come back after that. You have the good years in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. You're doing your thing in Houston. And then you, you tell a story about visiting Kobe in the locker room after the finals there yeah. in 08. And then you guys end up teaming up. And, like, the Lakers situation seemed like basketball nirvana for you because – you were with Lamar, yeah. and you were with Kobe, who you guys as competitors were going after it, now team together. It yeah. like, just seemed like that was the perfect situation for you to thrive. How do you feel about that? I thought it was great to, to play there. Um, Lamar, him. I grew up with Lamar. We got championships together. Um, we shared MVPs. Me, mm -hmm. Lamar, and Elton, and Eric Barkley sometimes, we always share MVPs in tournaments. And then to get a title with Lamar. It's big time. 
that, that, that was just amazing. I played with Elton Brand in Chicago. Kobe, Kobe, Kobe's dad and my dad went to the same high school. Oh, wow. In Philly. My dad that. from Philly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I do got a little bit of Philly. My dad got a little mm. Philly in him. I got a little Philly in so me. So you had the respect from Kobe in that aspect, the yeah. way that you went after him as a defender. We both from Philly. Yeah, yeah. For the most part. Yeah. You got that bloodline? Yeah, ain't no question <laughs> about it. I always saw it. I'm proud of that. Mm. And, you know, it was great. It was definitely a... And then Phil Jackson is my favorite coach because he was on the Bulls. Mm -hmm. Kobe plays like Michael Jordan. You know, Lamar Odom, 6'11", Tony Kukokis. Tony You're running Kukoc, the triangle. Running the triangle. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, this is, a, this is an absolute dream. Mm. And you enjoyed that moment, I think, more than anybody else. Absolutely. Like, first of all, you can the three in that final game. And I loved, in the doc, it, your whole family's up there with you for the press yeah. conference. You, you thank your psychologist for yeah. getting you through. Like, it's cool that you gave love to people. So why has it always been such an important part of your story and your legacy? Yeah, you know, um, just uh, giving back and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I, I just wanted to give thanks to people that helped me along the way. Therapists, I wanted to um, just kind of show my appreciation for Indiana. So I think Indiana Paces, you know, one of the first Donnie people I Walsh, think. Donnie yeah. Walsh, yeah. A lot of people to thank back then. I did because, like, those guys supported me and kind of made me into the champion, into the basketball champion that I became. And also, they gave me a platform to show my, uh, my, my frustration and, and, and lay out my stress, you know, when they would provide the therapist for me. Mm. You know, and, and, you know, they gave me tools, you know, to work with. So, uh, and you never know when you're gonna use those tools but you could always have something to you know, fall back on. So I just try to you know, just let people know thank you. Definitely, and just being open and honest about it. And you mentioned this in the documentary, but there is a lot of kids that could really use therapy right. that don't have access to it, can't afford it. I right. mean, even thinking about you back in Queensbridge, if, if you had had access to therapy at 13 years old in the same way that you did now in your life, it could have been a different story in a lot of ways. Well, I, you know, for one, well, that's me. I, I was actually taking therapy classes, but Group therapy is also important, family mm. therapy, marriage counseling. I don't think my parents ever did marriage mm. counseling. Um, and you have. We def yeah. I have. Yeah. Right? And we definitely never did family mm. counseling. You know, um, all these things is kind of important, you know, when you're trying to improve yourself. Definitely. And now there's guys like Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan right. talking about their stuff. What's it like for you to see that all these years later after you went through your struggles? It's really cool to see someone coming out and being vulnerable and letting everybody know, you know I have issues and um, I'm going through things. I'm only human. Right. I thought it was, I, I smell, you know, when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you did. Yeah. So you mentioned the Knicks before. You finally got to live out that dream. Yes. What do you remember the most about your days with the Knickerbockers? The, the, the Knicks is, you know, that was, um, I remember having f verbal fights with um, J.R. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> you guys butt heads? What was yeah, going we, on? we bought heads because, you know, I'm super old school, and mm -hmm. I wasn't able to show with my talent. I was hurt in New York, right? And I was older, mm -hmm. but mainly I was hurt, so I couldn't really show and prove on the court. So, it was things I didn't like that I would that I would we would have like I was arguments. I was like street arguments, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it wasn't because I didn't like those guys. It was because you got to do things the right way, right? You and know, you're the vet on that team, too, trying to show I'm them I'm a little old. Yeah. I think I was the oldest yeah. <laughs> on that team. Yeah. I think, oh, maybe um, Prigioni was older. Okay. But, you know, so I, I remember those times, and he became a champion later, so mm -hmm. that's really cool. I remember on um, my young Tim Hardaway mm. Jr., you know, uh, sometimes uh, he very confident player, wasn't a great defender at that time, and sometimes, you know, would think he's right. Right. You know, you got to step to him. Mm. Yeah, you got to step to him. It's a young guy mentality. You got to step to him. Like, yeah. listen, you know, and Iman Shumpert, I remember mm. working with Iman and, you know, Iman working hard and just, um, you, you, I'm not perfect and I'm definitely not like Michael Jordan. I'm not these great players, but I have the experience. Mm -hmm. And you want to at least give these guys as much as you can. And then I'm also trying to play. Right. So I was, I, at that point in New York, I was in a mix of mentoring and trying to play. Yeah. Right. And we were losing. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good time from that standpoint. Yeah, um, and, I, and, I, and my sister passed away also. 
New York was it was a great experience and it was a and it was a bad experience. If it had come some years earlier, it could have. Really I wish been I wish it would have came earlier. Just imagine a, a 23 year old. Oh my gosh, Lana Listen, Tessa, I'm a Knicks fan, so for yeah. years when it was like our test the Knicks, I was like that would have been. Perfect. I know I know LeBron said he's the king of New York all that stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> and I felt like. You know, I'm a New York guy. You're like, what about me? I've been well, doing I'm, it in Queensbridge, St. John's. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm older, so <laughs> God, I can't. you come play at MSG. It's one thing. I couldn't even back it up. Yeah. I'm like 38 years old. 30, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even go on the court but and be like, your yo. presence, it's like, oh, I met us here. You know, <laughs> New York guy. It was still fun to watch, though. I mean, you don't get you don't get no better. You don't get no better than a 23, 24-year-old, you know, run our test oh, in the garden. Forget it. You know, you don't get that. I mean, where, where else you don't get that experience at? You know, and um, I played. See, I played in the garden, mm -hmm. St. John's. So, uh, but one thing I can say is I put on a jersey, and there's a lot of New York fans that still talk about that moment where the Knicks passed me up. So, I I, I still get to relive, not even relive. I still get to uh, visualize me being in the garden mm. because people bring it up so much. I actually have the jersey on. I'm a proud New York guy, and um, you know uh, the Knicks will always be winners, you know, in my heart. Yeah, and we're waiting for that championship at some point. I know. know. I mean, we're, we're hopefully, hopefully they can get it done. Yeah, I'm really hoping they get it done. Hopefully they get a couple guys this summer. I'm hoping they get it done. That would be the key. You know, that, 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 yeah, definitely. And um, I'll be, I'll be rooting for them. We'll be at the, put you in the parade at that point, right? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'll be watching on TV somewhere maybe. <laughs> So when people watch this documentary and they think about your story, your legacy, what do you want people to walk away thinking about the person that Ron Artest was and the person that Meta Peace is? Well, it, it just depends. Like, there's a certain point in my life where I didn't really care what people think about me, but but now I realize, you know, it's important to give out good energy. Um, there's so much digital platforms and media messages is going out all the time. You can you can make somebody think about you differently today than something can happen tomorrow. Sure. So it's not about that. It's more about just something. Um, I just always try to tell people enjoy themselves, enjoy your family. That's pretty much it. You know, with me, I'm not looking for anything. I had a hundred. I had a couple hundred thousand followers on Instagram at one point, um, and I always, I always delete my Instagram all the Why time. Why is that? Because you know, I, I, although I'm doing stuff like this, documentaries mm -hmm. and back in the limelight, I, I'd rather be behind yeah. some type of curtain. I feel you. <laughs> some type of scene. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard when you, you know, a Ron Artest middle piece and you play for the Lakers and all that stuff. Sure. Can you imagine you know? a 23-year-old Ron Artest with social media? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been bad. That would have been pretty wild. It would have been, been wild. A 19-year-old Ron Artest in Chicago? It would have been wild. Posting up at Circuit City? Forget oh, it. It would have been wild. <laughs> it would have been, it would have been like, um, it would have been Woodstock. <laughs> it would have been Woodstock. <laughs> well, Matt, I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you so appreciate much. It. All right, guys, you can check out Quiet Storm, the, the Ron Artest story, May 31st on Showtime. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.